How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Friday here on the program, you know what that means. We have got a, a lot to talk about here today, not the least of which is the ratings for Dynamite. We got some minute-by-minute -minute notes on the MJF deal. Two WWE pay-per-views are coming up this weekend. If you're a fan of NXT 2.0 or, at this point, Raw, because we have no SmackDown matches so far for Hell in a Cell, we'll tell you about all of those here today. The latest on Lacey Evans, which I laughed uproariously about. Bunch of stuff happened at New Japan, best of the Super Junior Finals. We've got some returns, and we can talk to you about that today. Uh, update on Jeff Hardy and, uh, and much, much more. In the final segment of the show, Nick Aldis is going to join us here today. And... Uh, talk about the NWA, a lot of other stuff as well, and it's going to be fun. I'm going to do my best. I don't know if you can hear or not, but I'm pretty congested. I actually feel way better than I felt yesterday, but uh, my uh, my head is full of gunk and coughing a little bit, so I'm not at my best, but damn it, I'm here and ready to go. So uh, if you want to contact us, 425-780-7566, help carry the show. 425-780-7566, Brian at WrestlingObserver.com, at Brian Alvarez on Twitter, and uh, also F4W Online on Cameo. I got nothing to do, so if you want a Cameo, that would be a great time to do it. But Mike Sempervivi <clears throat> is going to join us after the break, and we're going to talk all of the news and uh, and get into all of this. So stick around, everybody. We'll be back here in a couple of moments Going to take a quick commercial break because I'm going to hear that music at any moment here on Wrestling Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Yes, for those of you asking, I feel much better than I sound. I actually sound the worst so far, but I feel the best so far. So I don't know what to make of that, but... Uh, You're almost over the hump. That's what that means. I sure hope so. <laughs> Yesterday was actually... Uh, I was, I was, I had a uh, low fever, and God, I was so hot all day, and I'm stuck here in this room, and uh, for once in my life, like, it's been nothing but cold since the beginning of the year, and then, of course, on the one day that I want to open the window for some air, it's like in the 70s, so I'm just baking, which is why you heard frogs last night. I left the window open during the, uh, the Brian and Vinny show, but I'm on the comeback trail, everybody. I am on the comeback trail. Rally back. It's the weekend, brother. Oh, yeah. I'm rallying back to two WWE pay-per-views. <laughs> well, <it's... laughs> uh, well um, your wife will be happy you feel better so she can take some of the pressure off the kids, you know, dealing with that. Wednesday is Double or Nothing Fallout episode of Dynamite. 969,000 viewers on TBS, up 4.3% from last week. Best audience for the show since April 13th. 18 to 49, Dynamite finished second with a .40, which was up 14.3% from last week. Dynamite's best number in the demo since March 23rd. Bunch of other notes right here, but I know what everyone's asking about. You're all asking about MJF. And uh, first, we had the quarter hours yesterday. And if you guys saw the quarters, we talked about it, I think, on the Brian and Vinny show. I do tell these shows. But what happened was the MJF promo was split over two segments. And the first two-thirds was in one segment. And the final one-third, if my math is correct, was in the, uh, the next segment. Okay? So, the segment that contained two-thirds of his interview was by far the highest-rated thing on the show. The segment that, continue, that contained the second half, or the second third of his promo, plunged down and ended up being the lowest rated thing on the show the least viewed so two-thirds was in the most viewed one-third was in the least viewed okay so of course you know it's the internet and everybody has their uh everybody has their side whether this was good or bad or whatever so everybody you know people were using that to prove it didn't work and everything like that so what we were waiting for obviously was the minute by minute numbers which uh, Brandon Thurston released yesterday. We now have them. And uh, what happened, which is actually what I figured would happen, 
the entire MJF promo was the most watched thing on the show by far from beginning to end. Okay. As soon as he called Tony Khan, whatever he called him, because for most people it was bleeped. As soon as they went to the commercial break, that's when everybody tuned out. And if you've, if you've ever paid any attention to the quarters, if you do a segment that has two commercials in that segment, which that segment did, they went to commercial and they came back and they did some stuff. And then they started a match and, uh, the match went to commercial for picture in picture. There were two commercial breaks during that segment. You are not going to have a quarter with two commercial segments that is not going to absolutely fall off a cliff, which is what happened. So if you want a place to blame on MJF, I'm sorry to tell you that uh, his promo was the most watched thing on the entire show. Now, of course, people are going to argue, well, you know, everyone turned it, tuned out afterwards. Well, you can make whatever argument you want. The reality is we have no idea if this is going to work or not. It just happened. I mean, doesn't matter what the promo is, doesn't matter what the angle is. Nobody knows how something is going to work until they do the follow-up and they do whatever they're going to do. So you're welcome to make all of your predictions and whether it's going to be like the greatest thing ever. Everyone's going to tune in next week to find out what happened. Or, oh, they're going to run off all these fans. People don't want to watch. Whatever your theory is, we don't know. We're going to find out based on the follow-up starting, I mean, maybe a little bit with Rampage, but my guess is next week on Dynamite. So those are the numbers, and uh, you can do with those what you will if you want to, but I would recommend against it. Have you su survived the slings and arrows over the last couple of days of being called out of touch or old or a contrarian that everybody else liked that promo except for you, Brian Alvarez? You're just doing this on purpose. Bro, I, uh, what, what is everyone even talking? If anyone said that, they're an idiot. But I've dealt with that a lot of late. <laughs> Dude, I said like his delivery of that promo was phenomenal. It was absolutely fantastic. But if you're going to sit here and pretend like there is no risk here, if you're going to sit here and pretend that him trying to cut a full heel promo and getting cheered is not the promo. You can do that if you want. Like, that's fine. You can do that. But it's what happened. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, his delivery was phenomenal. I never said anything negative at all about his delivery. He has probably the best delivery of anybody in all of wrestling when it comes to cutting promos. But don't act like there's no possibility that something could go wrong here. Like, well, virtually every other time this has ever happened, it hasn't worked. But this time, man, Brian, if you think it, it's, it's, it's not going to be a home run, you're old and out of touch. Well, that's foolishness. Now, you granted, most like of fun. these people are foolish, so who cares? You hate fun. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> oh, man. It's almost the weekend, though. We're almost done with this for now. No, and you not. don't have to look at social media at all until you start doing your, your full review in time of the NXT pay-per-view or pay-per-view special live premium event coming up on Peacock, which I know you're excited for. Bro, I never said it wasn't entertaining. What is wrong with people? I know. Honestly, I know. what is wrong with people? Bro, on, on Observer Live yesterday, the first segment of the show, I don't think I could have possibly been more fair and given... Like, both sides of this. I don't think I could have possibly been more fair. But what happens is, because everyone has to choose sides, you only hear the details what you, you want, want to hear. Of course. Irritating. Mm. And, bro, you guys are going to argue that Wardlow wasn't, like, overshadowed by this? Is anyone really going to argue that? That's the come funny on. one to me. That's the, the hilarious one to me is that the Wardlow did not come out of this looking, you know, the way he should be that next night and coming out of this and having somebody who, look, if you're going to powerbomb a guy 10 times, you're going to kill him dead. You're going to put him out on a stretcher like, you know, he may want to sell something the next day. If this was WWE, those same people would be, you know, bitching and moaning and complaining that this person didn't do this. And it's like. It's just crazy. And and to make the excuse while well, you would, would WWE does this, is that what you want to do? Is that what you want to be? <laughs> Wasn't the whole point of AEW starting up to not do what WWE does and drives people nuts and actually have? Uh, forget it. Lacey Evans is uh, probably going to debut on Sm I shouldn't say debut. Plans change, Brian. Plans change. No, no, no. <laughs> Yes, uh, Lacey Evans is actually at SmackDown right now. I don't know if she'll be on the show, but she's there. And uh, if you recall, she was on SmackDown, and then she was moved to Raw. 
and then she was announced as debuting on Raw, and then she didn't debut on Raw, and now she's been moved to SmackDown. <laughs> I am always the bad guy when it's so patently obvious they have no idea what they're doing ever. So anyway, now she's back on SmackDown, and, uh, you know, I, I guess we'll see what they do. I'm not even going to even bother speculating. I mean, maybe she'll be a heel, maybe she'll be a babyface. At this point, who cares? I mean, <laughs> so let's I'm, I'm over go out I got really again. mad one day, but, like, that's the great thing about having a show like this is I can get really mad about something, and then I just don't care anymore. It's actually great. It's cathartic. So, get yeah. it all out of your system, and then that's that. So she'll be on uh, SmackDown, probably as a heel, because, you know, why not? Why not? Yeah, of course. Well, let's waste five weeks of absolutely incredible videos to just have her be a heel. Yeah, I was was reading more about the MGF and the CM Punk thing, and uh, it's amazing, you know, how many people said, Brian, there's just no way that pipe bomb was supposed to be a, a heel promo. I mean, the next show was in Chicago. It's like... Guys, hello, wake up. You think, oh, my God. Have we not had decades of history that, oh, my God. But there's, hey, look, big recency bias here, you know. It's like the people that said WCW did this, but they never had any good times. They never had anything successful happen. And it's like, well, they kind of did. (laughs) CM Punk. CM Punk said it was designed to be a heel promo. Listen to the announcers after it happened. Is there trying to bury CM Punk and ask why the fans are booing him? I mean, or cheering him? It's Golly, help me. Back in a moment with something other than that. Observer Live. I cannot believe sometimes. All these years and people haven't learned. Don't harass me about what to talk about or I'm not going to do it. Leave me alone, especially when I'm sick. Now, with that said, I want to mention something about the best of the Super Juniors, okay? And, I mean, listen, to be fair, I didn't watch any of it. I pulled an MJF. I ain't watching no New Japan. Ugh. Which, by the way, my uh, uh, the impression I've been given is that wasn't a heel line. Guy hates New Japan. But anyway. <laughs> He really is taking all Cornette's material. <laughs> so, uh, I may as well get more heat while I'm at it. Go ahead, do it. Bro, Hiromu won again. Yeah, well. Even even uh, Jingo here, who's like a huge Japanese pro wrestling mark, even he got it wrong. <laughs> this is not Hiromu's third time winning the best of the Super Juniors. It's his fourth time since 2018. Hey, he, Bro, he's arguably listen, the best super junior in the world. I love Hiromu, okay? I love Hiromu. I love Okada. I love Naito. I love... You know, rattle off the list of guys. And granted, yes, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Yes, it's hard to get people in and out of Japan until just very recently. But, bro, is the same thing when they had that big stadium show. And it's like, what are we going to do for the IWGP title? Okada Naito. Bro, how many times can I see that match? How many times can Hiromu win the best of the Super Juniors? Like, dude, there were some talented dudes in that best of the Super Juniors. And I just feel like it's the same stuff over and over and over and over and over and over again. Now, hopefully, hopefully, this is all about to swing wildly. Oh, boy. Because now, positive thoughts. no more quarantine. Mm-hmm. Like, we can get people from AEW, we can get people, like, Jay White's no longer doing Impact, he's just going to be back full-time doing New Japan. Like, you know, we're going to get a lot of new names and faces and et cetera in there, but, bro, I need something different, dude. I mean, Well, you know, I have brought up Gato's booking for quite some time, and we've been into it over that, and I thought there was a way you and could And by the way, in. one thing real quick. It's not only it's not only the fourth time that Hiromu has won the best of the Super Juniors, but it was the same damn final that we had two years ago. My voice box is falling out. <laughs> Look, some yes, of these people, fourth. Some of these folks that are coming. <laughs> some of these guys that are coming. You in thought here my voice just... sucked before? <laughs> Golly! There goes puberty. <laughs> 
they are, that just may be a band-aid, though, on some of the things that we have been driven nuts about. We'll get some new faces in. We'll get some familiar faces we haven't seen in some time. But some of the booking, a lot of the booking that has gone on with Gato has not been good. Too much reliance on the Bullet Club, which now we see another member added to the Bullet Club, Ace Austin. <laughs> And has now got to be a Bullet Club member because you need to have a zillion of them. So I do have concern. Again, much like the MJF CM Punk deal within that promo by MJF, I'm willing to give it some room to breathe. But when it comes to New Japan, I'm only going to give it so much room to breathe here before they can try to turn around and make something something happen here because the House of Torture Bullet Club stuff is way, way, way too much. And I know they have wanted for quite some time. Hiromu has talked about for a long time. I want to be the the New Japan IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion and main event one of the, the, the Dome shows. I hope this is the year because he has got to get out of that division, become a heavyweight, just get out of there altogether. There's nothing else to accomplish. And when you watch that tournament, and I know you didn't, when you see the names that are there, the new names that have come in, like your Wheeler Yudas and like guys like that, guys who have been there like El Fantasmo, who has been fantastic, and the fact that I would argue the best junior heavyweight in the world is El Desperado. I mean, you have enough guys there. Tai Taiji Ishimori and El Desperado can, on their backs, completely run that side of the junior heavyweights with the new names coming in and other people getting built up. Hiromu doesn't need it. So I hope this is going to be it. I'm willing to go till January 4th or whatever it is, the 6th, whatever the, the, the third day is going to be and, and be all right with it. But like, he has got to get out of that division, do something in the heavyweight division because somebody's going to have to replace Naito at some point too, because he's being held together by tape right now. And I always, you know, I'm, I'm constantly waiting for Hiromu to not, take his spot but to kind of slide into it more and we see a little less naito and i we'll have to see how it goes but you know new japan's booking just because new guys are coming in we've talked about it you know and guys coming back does not automatically make things better it, the booking has been atrocious for a while a couple of returns of the show kenta is back jay white cut a promo for the semifinal announced kenta's return uh, he says, I know we're a little shorthanded today. The machine gun Carl Anderson couldn't make it. He's out with COVID. Juice Robinson couldn't make it either. He's out with, um, what the hell, what, what did he have? I forget. He had Ooh, something. Which one? Juice Robinson. Oh, uh, appendicitis. Yeah, that's right. But I do have one surprise, and it was Kenta. He has not been around since January 5th when he suffered a dislocated left hip, a broken nose, tendon damage to his finger, and severe lacerations to his back in that ladder match with Tanahashi. It, which, I mean... So that's why he's not going to be a tournament of survival this weekend anybody for Anybody not know that was coming? Not that he was going to get that hurt, but... Well, I mean, come on now. I mean, you can't... Look, there have been guys who have done a lot bigger stunts and gone through a lot more stuff and actually not been hurt, but... Well, yeah, but the whole point going in was, why are these two great wrestlers being put in this garbage match... They well. damn near killed poor Kenta. And then also we had the return of Sonata, who is uh, recovering from a fractured orbital bone, suffered in the New Japan Cup in a match with Will Ospreay. So uh, he is back as well. Looks and, fantastic uh, in a suit, doesn't he? We need some, we need some names, brother. Need what do you think about Sonata? Folks coming back. The times you've seen him, because I always disagree with Adam Summers on this, on the Big Audio Nightmare, which you can find at F4WOnline.com. I think Sonata has always been missing something. You look at him and you think of this course is a he guy. Is. Adam and Adam uh, argues this. Well, he he's a, he is a a Sonata supporter. So well, I am been, too. But I mean, it's patently obvious he's missing something. He's missing something, and it's there. The connection, the crowd loves him, but there is a connection issue somewhere there. And you look at him, and it's like he. You know, IWGP heavyweight champion, a, a contender for sure. He can work his ass off. You see the matches with him and Zack Sabre Jr. He's very, very good. He just needs something, and that's another thing. Hopefully the booking can, whatever that thing is, he needs it now because now that he's been out, he's coming back, going after the U.S. title. This is kind of do or die for him as far as him ever being a serious really being a serious threat to actually win and hold on to the IWGP title. My issue with Sonata is in storyline he's an idiot. <laughs> How many that? times has this guy almost had the win with his dragon sleeper, and he lets go of it to go miss a moonsault? How many times <laughs> I've seen that? It's like, brother, 
Stop trying the moon salt. I don't care if you were a big fan of Mudo. You almost what? won and you let go of it and then you missed the moon salt. You dummy. Like 50 times I've seen that spot. <laughs> I start Golly. blowing mist instead. He needs a manager <laughs> like me. Oh, no. Yeah. He can do the work and I can, uh, you know, hack my way through a promo. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it would be really clever to offer uh, cameos while I was uh, quarantined. Oh, that's right. How's that worked out for you? You should see these cameos I'm doing. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> Is there a botchamania for cameos? There should be. It's pretty bad. Matt Hardy explained his brother Jeff was pulled from Dynamite this week. Matt Hardy said in the podcast, Jeff was almost knocked out very early on in the Hardy's match against the Young Bucks. This resulted in Jeff being pulled from Dynamite. Matt said, yeah, I was happy with the match, especially considering very early on in the match, Jeff was almost knocked out. So he got hurt pretty bad. That's why he was being pulled from the match in L.A. He was kind of running on fumes going through the match, so he still held up his end of the bargain pretty good in the grand scheme of things. So listen, I know a lot of people are upset about the idea that this guy got a concussion early on and they kept doing the match, and uh, I don't like that at all. I, I do, however, often give talent the benefit of the doubt in the sense that they didn't necessarily know that, that 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 happened. Like, I haven't talked to anybody in the match, so I don't know if they knew or not. But, like, let me tell you something about uh, Young Bucks matches. And actually, it was, it was AJ Styles on our, uh, on our show many years ago. I'll never forget this. I was at King of the Indies in 2001, and AJ Styles was going to have a match in the tournament. And, bro, this guy got in the ring... And he was in there for like four hours going over spots with whoever he was wrestling that night. I was like, dude, just hour after hour after hour after hour of practicing and going over these moves. And then, uh, you know, later he, you know, decade later, 15 years later, he goes to New Japan and uh, he's doing matches with the Bucks. And, uh, and he explained, he goes, dude, they want to do so many things. I can't remember any of that. So I just sit there and have him tell me what to do in the match. So, you know, Jeff Hardy is not used to doing those sorts of matches. So it's possible because I heard that Jeff was banged up going in, okay? Which I'm sure he was if you saw some of his matches he's had. And, uh, you know, it's possible that they didn't realize at the time that that was the issue. They just figured, like, God, this guy can't remember anything. we got to tell him what to do. There's 8 million spots in this match. So, you know, I I don't know. But I, I like to think that... They didn't realize he was concussed immediately and then decided to go 14 minutes. I don't know, but I do like to think that that didn't happen. Well, who's supposed to be making that call? You know, I'm in the NFL now. Well, it should be the know. referee. Well, and there, there should be whoever thing. notices. Well, that's a, it's, you know, is there a spotter there? It's, it, it's, it's tough because you get a, a situation like Hikuleo. Uh, a couple nights ago where he dives out of the ring and he, you know, DDTs himself on the floor and then he's jumping right back up. And it's like, you know, did, did he suffer a concussion? And then, you know, again, there's different grades of concussions. You know, guys, athletes get their bell rung all the time. And now we know they're like little mini concussions. But, you know, when you're still when you're in athletics, you know, you get your bell rung. You can still go. You still go. But you never know. Sad. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Nick Aldis joining us here today. NWA Always Ready is coming to uh, to the Knoxville Convention Center. Nick, how you doing today? I'm good, Brian. It's been a long time. How are you? It has. You've brought some class to this show. Well, you know, allegedly. Now, obviously, the very first question is uh, obviously the... Uh, the situation with, um, I guess, your main event, really. Uh, yeah. Matt Cardona suffered a uh, torn biceps over the weekend. And uh, what's the status of the match? What do you know? Um, I don't know a whole lot. Uh, I've, I've got a call, actually, um, uh, in about an hour or so. Uh, so right, right after I get off this call with you guys, um, I'll be getting ready for that. And I guess that's where uh, I'll get. Uh, I'll get kind of the four one one. Um, so uh, unfortunately, your timing is not great. If I had, had, you, had we scheduled this for a couple of hours later, I might have been able to lend you a bit more insight. But um, you know, it, it is what it is. I uh, when I heard that he'd torn his bicep, um, my initial I, right away I, I said I, I bet it was catching a dive, and sure enough, 
that's exactly what it was because that's how I tore my bicep uh, in Mexico in in uh, 2015. Um, same thing. So it's you know that's it's one of the sort of it's one of the new risks. You know, I guess in sort of modern wrestling, it's like that's that's quite a common injury is 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 the uh, torn bicep from catching a dive or torn pec from catching a dive because you know they're commonplace and um, yeah, unfortunately that was the case. So I will. I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see what we're going to do. But uh, the good thing is, is that at least it, you know, even though it's uh, unfortunate um, for, for Matt in one respect, it does at least create some intrigue because uh, as we've, as we've seen um, very much this last weekend from, you know, with the MJF stuff and stuff like that, sometimes uh, people being unsure of, you know, what's real and what's not is, is uh, can sometimes be quite good for creating intrigue. You know, I've uh, talked to a lot of people about dives because dives are big in wrestling nowadays. And uh, I wanted to get your thoughts because, you know, it's not just catching the dive that, uh, that we've seen issues with. But, you know, there, there are a lot of dives nowadays that are very hard to catch. You know, you, you hear the yeah. term catch. And, uh, you know, I don't want to call out Sammy Guevara or anything like that, but, man, he did, like, a, a twisting Phoenix splash 630 off the top of a ladder, and he crashed and burned. And, like, you know, everyone that was supposed to catch him, like, it was like a 7-10 split. And I just watched, and I thought, well, what was supposed to happen? Like, how right. in the world could you possibly <laughs> catch that without getting killed? And, you know, I, I don't want to sound like the old man yelling at clouds, but, I mean, there is something to the idea that, you know, I feel like a dive has to be capable of being caught. Otherwise, it's just dangerous. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, um, you know, for me, like it was always, it's always been something that I've prided myself on, uh, it, you know, is always making sure I was there. And I think, you know, for me, I sort of cut my teeth doing that in TNA, you know, because it was uh, – TNA was, in many ways, was, um, you know, was where a lot of that stuff was – was becoming more commonplace, right? Like, you know, we had all the X Division guys and stuff like that. And I was, especially when Doug and I were in the tag team, uh, a lot of the time, you know, I, we would find ourselves in matches where a dive was coming. Um, so for me, I've my my technique has always been to, to sort of get under the, you know, look for the hips, like get under the hips and kind of if, if because it's the sort of center point of the body and it's kind of a, it's a pivot point of movement. So if you can kind of make yourself big and get under the hips uh, and then sort of be ready to, uh, you know, almost be like a shock absorber, like, um, you know, that that's, that's, it's not just about being there. It's also about kind of uh, using the right technique to be able to sort of take it. And look, I, you know, I, I, I still feel weird even today, um, you know, sort of dissecting the fourth wall stuff like this, but, you know, I, I know that it's, people are interested in this kind of stuff. So, for me, it's always been a case of um, take the take the majority of the force, try to sort of push some of it back the other way, because uh, it because then it helps it helps you go down, it helps them stay up, and you know helps sort of share the share the impact. Uh, and and um, but I, no, you're right. Some of these new ones they're they're tricky because if there's a lot of rotations and a lot of twists and stuff like that, it's it's uh, it's hard to time it, but. For me, it's always been sort of look for the hips and get underneath it. So you've been doing this now, uh, what, 20 years? Is it no, 20? not quite. Um, 19 years? 18, I guess, 17 or 18 years. I, I, I started training with the Knights when I was 17. And I sort of went full-time at 18. And I'm 35 now, so. So what, because uh, you mentioned, you know, still kind of feeling weird talking about the inner workings of wrestling. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot has changed in the last 19 years. And, uh, you know, what what do you you feel about that? Because fans are very interested in it. But at the same time, I mean, you know, it is sort of fun to not, you know, if you've got like some great storyline going on, it's sort of fun to not kind of explain what's actually going on. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but I, I, I felt that way myself, like, you know, fans want to know what's happening, and uh, but at the same time, it's right. like part of the fun is not knowing. Yeah, it's you said that fans want to know, and that and that pretty much is the the beginning and end of it. Like that, it, it's a you know, look, it's a business, it's supply and demand. Um, there is such a 
there is, there is such a hunger for for the information even if to your point it may actually in some in some cases in my opinion sort of take away from the enjoyment of it or take away from the take away from the magic of it maybe take away from the excitement a little bit uh i think that and i can't speak for the industry obviously but i think that overall what i've noticed is that i think the industry overall sort of took this mentality of well they're going to talk about it anyway and someone's going to break it someone's going to stooge someone's going to leak so uh the the business as uh, as a whole has been a bit more open because they've realized that one way or another the information is going to find its way into people who want to consume it anyway so uh, like it's a it's a double-edged sword i think that again referring back to you know what we've seen this past week and a bit um I think it's I think we're witnessing maybe a new uh, a, a new age like a, a new uh, and, I, and what I mean by that is uh, this be might become the new way to sort of to book angles is to is to sort of lean into that and uh, and use it to your advantage. It's certainly something that I've tried to do. It's certainly something that Cody and I tried to do uh, in our angle was we we were we we're very open to the idea of letting people sort of interpret things however they wanted to uh and 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 then just sort of going oh if that's how oh that's what you think oh okay well i guess we'll see you know because there were so many there were so many real elements that that created a situation where people who are a little uh, more in the know than the average fan we're sort of going well wait a minute but cody's not cody's not under contract there he's under contract to ring of honor and you know but, but do you really see them doing that and like but at the same time you know it's cody kind of booked this event so is he gonna really you know it's like we just we just it once we knew that we had the intrigue that's the hardest part of booking an angle is can you get the people to a point where they want to see the outcome but they don't know what the outcome is going to be those are the two things because you know I, I've worked for a few different bookers, right? And I'm sure that you can guess who I'm probably referring to here. But, you know, I worked for, I worked for one booker for a while where a lot of the time stuff was changed just for the sake of because no one was expecting it. Yes. Right? Like, And I was told, well, that, that's too predictable, you know? And I'd be like, okay. But just because somebody – just because the fans – don't see this coming doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they want to see, right? <laughs> like, you know, you've got to sort of find that happy medium because sometimes giving the people what they want is what a promoter is supposed to do. Yes. Right. Like sometimes, you know, sometimes uh, throwing a curveball, sometimes sort of keeping the people on their toes and doing something surprising is is the right thing to do. But we, we I think sometimes, I think the business overall, I think the industry gets in its own way sometimes, trying so hard to do something different that they forget the fact that you know some people just like burgers and fries man you know <laughs> some people just want a really good burger and fries and they want it you know they want it hot and fresh and they want it served the way they like it uh and i think that finding the happy medium of creating a situation where people are intrigued about the outcome um but still maintaining an emotional investment in the parties involved uh, I think you get, you know, you could have to use whatever you have at your disposal to get there. And if that means leaning on some things that, that may or may not be really happening, um, you know, or things that involve the, the commercial aspect of the business, the personal side of the business, the, you know, the contractual stuff and things like that, then I think if you, if, you know, you just got to do it and stay healthy. But I will say this, that I think that uh, when you do that stuff, it's, in, in many ways, from a booking point of view, it's very similar to like the first time someone dives off a balcony, right? Or the first time someone goes through a flaming table or something, it's like, well, what about the next time, you know? <laughs> and now the angles that don't have all those elements in them, are they gonna be as interesting and intriguing? So, you know, you've gotta, you gotta be very careful and very, you gotta use them very sparingly, in my opinion. You know, as far as uh, to do a follow-up there, swerves, I mean, that is like one of those big things where people just, you know, they love to book swerves. And I've always felt that, like, you can you can do a swerve as long as the outcome is something where fans think, 
I didn't see that coming, but that makes sense. Right. As opposed to, I didn't see that coming, but what? Why did they do that? So it can be yeah. done, but it takes like some some foresight, and it takes you know leading everyone down one path, going another way, and then bringing them back to that path. So they're like, why didn't I see that coming? That makes perfect sense. That to right. me is a good swerve. Not we're going to lead everybody in one direction, and in the very end, we're just going to do something nonsensical, and then the fans, you know, they don't feel like they've been outsmarted. They, they, right. What they actually feel is like these people are incompetent. Well, or or when they feel like okay, you guys uh, used creative license um and you just made shit up you know like yes yeah. it's and again yeah it's because you are you know um you're still a promoter right even even if you even if you look at the business as a lot of people do now they oh it's a television based business you know like it, television is most important if that if, if that's your bread and butter then yeah sure it is but I think you st- I still believe that you have to approach it overall from the mentality of a promoter meaning like you have to promise something and deliver it uh and if it's when you it's when you don't deliver something um i think i don't think i'm i'm going to be alone in this opinion but you know i think the main reason tna's pay-per-views uh did not do well most of the time is because most of the time they felt like a long episode of the show you know that because there were too many times where people went okay here's my money like now give me the payoff yeah, people throw these terms around, right? In wrestling, like they, you know, like the, and they, but it's, it's so it's so funny because a lot of the time they've sort of forgotten what they mean, right? Like the payoff. That's, I mean, it does exactly what it says on the tin. That's what that's what it's supposed to be. You're supposed to tee it up, tee it up, tee it up with the with the free television, and then pay it off, you know. And if you don't pay it off, uh, you're going to lose the trust of the audience. And once you lose the trust of the audience, uh, you're toast. Well, the uh, show's coming up on June 11th, Knoxville Convention Center, Knoxville, Tennessee. The scheduled main event, uh, Matt Cardona and Nick Aldis. But as noted, in a few hours, we're going to know what's going on. So stand by. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Nick Aldis joining us here today. And we didn't talk about it, but uh, LegacySups.com. I'm at the tail end of COVID right now, so I probably could have... Uh, but superfood green and red, like I could use a superfood right now. Yeah, you could use a bit of that for sure, and maybe some recovery PM to make sure that you're getting a good, healthy night's sleep. It's uh, it's the it's one of the most effective ways to uh, to see some profound changes in your health and well-being is to get a real good night's sleep. So, what can you tell us about this very quickly? Oh well, it's we it's um it's a, it it started as a side hustle and it's very very quickly becoming uh, <laughs> a primary hustle. <laughs> we, we have we've had some great success and growth and we're um we launched at the very end of 2020 but really seriously launched in 2021. We've had uh, great feedback. We've we've had thousands of customers, and um, we're we're now on Walmart online and uh, we've had you know wow. we've had incredible feedback. Uh, from our, our customers, our, our, um, our return customer rate is is really impressive. And so we appreciate all of the wrestling fans because we know that a lot of our initial customer base is made up of wrestling fans because we advertise through some of our pals through like Conrad and Conan and different guys like that. So um, we, we deeply appreciate it and we're continuing to grow and scale. So please give us a try. The, uh, the, the we, we really appreciate it. And I stand by it. I use all the stuff myself. I wouldn't advertise something I don't use myself. Well, LegacySubs.com, you can check that out. And uh, don't forget, NWA Always Ready is coming up June 11th, the Knoxville Convention Center, Knoxville, Tennessee. We'll find out what's going on soon. Matt Cardona, Nick Aldis, Camille, Kylan King, Jack Stane, Chris Adonis for the National Heavyweight title. There's a ton of matches. And uh, I want to wish you the best of luck with everything. hope everything works out with uh, you and Cardona, obviously. And hopefully we can have you on again soon. Absolutely. Happy to. Thanks, Brian. Thanks so much. And of course, thanks everybody for listening. We're out of time. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.